Andrea Celli, who teaches Italian and Mediterranean studies at the University of Connecticut. He graduated in Italian philology at the University of Padua, where he also received his PhD in 2004. He recently published Dante and the Mediterranean Comedy from Muslim Spain to Postcolonial Italy, uh, published by Paul Grade Macmillan in two, um, 2022. He is currently working on two book projects, a monograph on early modern European representations of Hagar and Ishmael, as genealogical symbols of religious conflict, and a book on Muslims and the Eucharist in medieval and early modern legends. But, uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here, and uh, um, uh, I, I don't, I cannot see those who are not here. Uh, but uh, greetings to everybody. So um, I feel a little bit uh, uncomfortable speaking after the two uh, um, speakers that preceded me, um, and I would like to uh, begin by acknowledging that uh, my talk will uh, address only a small portion. Uh, Okay, great. Thank you. So that, there is the title, I guess. So um, uh, to many topics at which I hint in this uh, definitely over ambitious, uh, ambitious title uh, uh, will be addressed in my uh, presentation today. Uh, when uh, Catherine asked me uh, if I was willing to present a paper on, on the tree uh, of lives uh, made in Dante uh, some months ago, uh, I was probably uh, too optimistic and rash. And uh, the topic as we just heard is uh, um, uh, dizzling, intricate and stratified and uh, you know, but after a few months of reading, I'm I'm still uh, lost uh, in uh, in the complexity of the uh, um, uh, ramification of the topic. Uh, yet, uh, after discarding uh, various alternative paths for my paper, I, I stumbled uh, on a stanza um, uh, from a la uh, lauda, a, a devotional uh, rhymed song uh, by the 13th century uh, Franciscan friar uh, Jacopone da Todi a poet and a mystic uh, 30 years older than, uh, than Dante. Uh, the Lauda uh, begins uh, with uh, uh, the refrain that you can see uh, in Umbrian vernacular uh, as well, the entire collection by this, um, uh, that by this poet. Homo mitete a pensare uh, onne te ven lo gloriare. Men consider closely from where your sense of glory comes. At stanza, uh, at stanza nine uh, of the Lauda, a tree appears uh, almost abruptly. Um, Aguarda l'albore o homo quanto fa suave pomo odorifero e pomo e saporoso nel gustare. Oh man, look at the tree, how pleasantly scented is the apple it bears and delicious its taste in the mouth. The pride of man that is revealed by the fashionable clothes that they wear contrasts with the inviting scent of the apple born by a tree. Uh, no, born of a tree. Uh, what intrigued me uh, about these lines uh, was their uh, simplicity, but also the likeness to the language employed by uh, Dante in describing two trees he encounters while ascending uh, the upper part of Mount Purgatory in company of the poets of Virgil and Statius. A tree gets unexpectedly, once again, it's in their way, at the entrance of the terrace of Glutons, Glutons in Canto 22, almost as if it was a person. The two Roman poets, Virgil and Statius, had just met and were celebrating each other's company with words of admiration. And Dante was following, um, I'm quoting, behind them, listening to their colloquy of on poetry, uh, like a, a pupil, like a, like a student would do, at least in Italy. Uh, they were entering the terrace of Glattons when quickly, Tosto, uh, their sweet, and you can read uh, the, uh, the English translation, 
ma tosto ruppe le dolci ragioni un alber che trovammo in mezza strada con pomi a odorar soavi e buoni. E come abete in alto che digrada di ramo in ramo, così quello in giuso credi io perché persona si non vada. Their sweet conversation was broken by a tree that we found, trovammo, in the middle of the way, with fruit, fruit agreeable and nice to smell. So um, you can see in the, in the slide the uh, uh, similarities in terms of word choice. Um, alber, al, armore, pomo, pomi, odorifero, odorar, suave, suave. The association of Jacopone with Dante would uh, indeed be feeble uh, if it rested only on these few lines. Uh, Jacopone da Todi uh, is not among the famous uh, Franciscan personalities celebrated by Dante in Paradiso. His name is never mentioned in the comedy and does not seem to have exerted any direct influence on Dante. Uh, numerous are though uh, the the analogies between their biographies. Uh, for instance, they have one giant common foe and common enemy that is Pope Boniface VIII. And they both test uh, from different angles uh, the ability of vernacular poetry, uh, respectively in Umbrian and in Toscan, to translate into words their singular mystical experiences. I say singular because uh, what they do in terms of relation with mysticism is quite different. Um, there also is a, an, an, an eminent tradition of studies on Dante, uh, the comedy and Franciscan literature and spirituality, uh, of which Jacopone da Todi is one of the most remarkable uh, figures. Um, a small uh, yet very significant uh, element in Jacopone's quote uh, is missing, is missing as, as you can see, in Dante's lines. And that made me think of a possible topic of inquiry for this conference. In his stanza, um, Jacopone uh, evokes the flavorful taste of the apple. E como è saporoso nel gustare, uh, how delicious it, its taste um, is in the mouth. Uh, mouth is not there, but gustare is implies that you know, the mouth, physical. There is a no condemnation there uh, for the enjoyment of the fruit, fruit's taste, uh, which could come as a surprise to those, uh, including myself, who are not an expert in Jacopone and uh, in, in, in Christian mysticism um, of this century. Um, uh, so for those who have a superficial image of medieval asceticism, so when we think of, uh, Franciscans, do we think of enjoying the flavor of the fruit? Um, vice versa, the fruits on the twin tree uh, that Dante and his two mentors encounter on their way to the top of Purgatory cannot be severed, cannot, must not be severed. The apples are meant to stimulate an unbearable craving in the souls of the gluttons, but contrary to the poems on the tree, in Genesis 2, 3, they are out of their reach. Thank you so much for both. Yeah, the, the other side. But anyway. um, so uh, this is from a, a, a manuscript from the second half of the 14th century, as you can see. Uh, and uh, and the, here, the, the artist, the illuminator, is, is trying to convey the, uh, the fact that the tree cannot be uh, climbed. Uh, and the oh, the fruits are out of reach. The, the small guy <laughs> is uh, Forese Donati, who is a, a, a friend from Dante's youth. Um, who is there, and we will not enter into why he's there. It's a huge uh, chapter in the in Purgatory, Teodolinda Parolini, uh, work a lot, but there are chapters. But anyway, 
on the right, you see uh, the clergy and the left dante. There is no statues there. Um, and here I just lost the where it was. So Dante explains uh, that uh, as a as a fir tree tapers upward from branch to branch, that tree there uh, tapered downward. So as I think ward off any climber. This is a purgatory 22nd lines 133-135. Also, uh, a voice uh, from within the leafy branches of this tree, uh, this is another manuscript, very famous in Orkham, it's a news for today, it's uh, at uh, the Bodian Library, uh, uh, says, di questo cibo avrete caro, you will miss this food. This is my translation. Uh, other prefer, prefers, you shall not have any of this food. But in Caro, uh, there is also the, the, the missing, the idea of wanting it, uh, uh, feeling the, the lack. And uh, two cantos two later, um, in Purgatory 24, Another voice uh, will echo on the right side here. You have on the left uh, the, the one that we saw on the right, the following one. Uh, says, uh, um, pass farther on, pass farther on without drawing near. Trapassate over the caro. And which reminds me of the fact that the tree of knowledge uh, of, um, good and evil has this voice speaking that is the serpent no so but here the voice uh is saying you want you will not touch it and not only you will not touch it you will not able to touch it because it's out of which you will feel the craving for it you will not touch it um uh, so um these letter was so uh, okay. The, the same voice says uh, um, um, reveals that uh, this tree, the tree that we just saw, in reality there are two trees, identical trees, for what we understand. One at the beginning of the of the terrace of Blatons, the other at the end. <laughs> um, they are mirroring each other. Um, also reveals that this this trees stem the uh, Silevo derives, like uh, botanically, uh, uh, from the one that is farther up, that is, it's not, that is a few uh, soup uh, in the mountain, that um, was beaten by Eve, and uh, the tree, not the, the fruit, was beaten. And so <laughs> she ate the tree, not the, the fruit. And this is a, a detail in the exege exegesis, I, I guess, really relevant. And I don't know nothing, I don't know anything. <laughs> so there is immediately, so there is this tree, these two trees, they are in relation with another tree that probably we will need um, to give you uh, um, um, an idea of what oh, I will end it up is that I'm not sure we are meeting that tree in, in, the, in, in the purgatory and the Eden in the earthly uh, uh, paradise where Virgin will end up on the top of non-purgatory. To get to my to my point, the small variance between Jacopone and Dante sparked my interest in reading uh, these lines uh, literally. Uh, Certainly, Dante's trees in Purgatorio are the offshots of, of the mythical trees of Eve and Aden, but also perhaps of the tree of life, because if, if we look at the, the commentaries of the Divine Comedy, the meaning, the identity of these trees um, is, is not clear to the commentators, to the, to the reader. Some mention the tree of life, some mentioned the tree of knowledge of uh, good and evil. 
uh, the, the, these different trees kind of uh, uh, are not clearly differentiated. Um, uh, so, uh, and, and this tree, according to Dante, is higher in the earthly paradise, which is at the top of Mount, Mount Purgatory. Um, rather than reading it allegorically, um, I was fascinated by the idea of taking these trees uh, for what they are, what they, what they also and primarily are, uh, which is a source of life as sustenance. So these fruits are to be eaten, even if they are forbidden. So the, the ethical question that I tried to capture, I tried to capture in, in my title, uh, was about the relation with food uh, in the age uh, and place um, or uh, like the one Jacopone and Dante did. Uh, the late medieval Apennine, Apennine uh, Italy, the Mediterranean. These are centuries in which many experienced uh, dire uh, food scarcity uh, because of the uneven distribution of natural resources. Um, in what way is the Franciscan idea of poverty an answer to concrete forms of poverty uh, and hunger, uh, to the hunger experienced by many, uh, to the uneven access to the fruits hanging from the tree? And perhaps more importantly, uh, what does this medieval response to scarcity the spiritual and ethical dimension of it can tell us who experience a very different relationship with food and with the often devastating impact of contemporary food industry on, and I'm quoting, um, our sister mother Earth. Earth. And here we are at the foundational text, text now of uh, uh, Franciscanism that is uh, the um, Laude Cardinalum by St. Francis, no? Um, Praise be you, my Lord, Lord, Sister, Mother, for Earth, who sustains us and govern us, and who produces very fruits with all of flowers and herbs. Those words by Jacopone da Todi uh, seem to me a notable touchstone through which to assess our relationship with food as contemporaries, the machinery of food production and contemporary understanding of natural resources. Jacopone asks that we, and I'm quoting again, look at the tree, how pleasantly scented is the apple there, and delicious, a delicious its taste in the mouth. Uh, this involves a degree of appreciation and awareness about a single fruit, that is probably remote from the experience, as we call it, uh, of the food uh, that the mechanization of food industry allows us. Uh, this is, however, um, I have to confess, as far as I can go today, in addressing the question encapsulated in, in the title of my presentation. This is sort of is where I would like to go, <laughs> if I could, uh, if I had the time. Um, so in, in the reminder of, of the time that I have uh, uh, today, um, I would like to review uh, some of the groundwork that I came soon to realize after giving uh, Catherine the title that I, I needed to under undertake, uh, not just to address these questions, but more fundamentally to familiarize myself with the, with the, topic, with the topic of the conference when it is approached from a perspective which combines the history of early Franciscan spirituality with a close reading of the Divine Comedy in its early reception and interpretation. Um, I will accompany my presentation with uh, copies of illuminated manuscripts and uh, other visual sources because uh, and, I'm uh, among uh, colleagues or specialists or uh, visual sources, uh, but because images are intrinsic uh, components of the sources that we will uh, uh, briefly uh, discuss. 
hopefully this itinerary can be at least uh, informative. Um, it's a sort of the, the workshop, if you want, uh, the messy workshop of preparing for talking about this topic. Um, or at least a little bit entertaining because as you will see the images, the detailed images uh, doesn't even need in some cases. I would like to mention first uh, uh, those section of my, let's call it groundwork with some optimism that I will not discuss in depth today but, uh, because they are not directly related to the, the subject of the conference, uh, the, despite being a, a relevant to, to the topic. For instance, uh, it would be important for me to gain a clear understanding of Franciscan uh, monastic rules and of the various biographies of the founder uh, when it comes to the relationship with food. Uh, the specific attitude of Francis uh, of Assisi and the spirituality stemming from his orders must then be placed in the larger context of monastic rules more broadly and the anthropology of food in, in Italy in the Mediterranean Middle Ages. I would also like to better appreciate the theological and political implication of these rules, uh, which is a line of investigation undertaken by uh, Giorgio Agamben in the highest poverty monastic rules and form of life. And uh, I thought of quoting it by, uh, with, the, with the cover because it's, it's very, uh, um, comes really, uh, um, handy in this situation. Everybody possibly recognized the end of Giotto here, a contemporary of Dante, um, is the St. Francis preaching to the birds, and you can see that the tree, uh, the oak tree, I believe, uh, uh, on the right. And perhaps more, most more famous is the identical scene from the cycle of 28 priscos uh, dedicated to the legend of St. Francis in the upper church of St. Francis in Assisi. So I guess, I, I guess that you already have a, a taste of the, a little bit randomness of this uh, tour across sources. But the two uh, main issues that I would like to briefly approach today are, that rem reminds a little bit the question with which uh, uh, Yossi started. Is there a tree of life uh, in Dante's comic in the first place? Uh, and where is it? And the second intertwined question is, uh, what does the tree, uh, the tree, sorry, of life uh, represent in the early history of Franciscan uh, spirituality up to Jacopone da Todi? What are the images of tree that we find in the Franciscan tradition? This is uh, informative for me in the sense that I'm learning uh, um, uh, uh, this thing. So I, I hope there will be some uh, um, patience with these, if some of these things are obvious. Readers of the Divine Comedy are confronted with uh, uh, copious images of trees, uh, woods, and plants uh, as symbolic of a diverse range of eschatological things. For instance, th there is a metaphorical reference to um, a cosmic tree at the beginning of Canto 18 of Paradiso. Um, Dante, the character, is about to leave uh, Mars, uh, the heaven of all holy warriors. Uh, just to kind of say with the Yossi that sometimes the, the images of the tree are not necessarily images of peace and reconciliation. Uh, the ancestor is a uh, um, crusader and is celebrating the, in, in Mars as a representative of spiritual. Um, you know, uh, fighting of a true faith. Um, who described the structure of paradise as, uh, and the quote should be there, but, uh, uh, yes, it's, uh, so began in, in this fifth threshold, in questa quinta soglia dell'albero che vive della cima e frutta sempre mai non tarda foglia, e poi segue, so in this fifth threshold of the tree that draws life from its summit and bears fruit perpetually without shedding a leaf, there are blessed spirits who below, before they came to heaven at great fame so that every muse would be richly, richly furnished by them. 
therefore gaze at the horn of the cross. The one I name will move there like swift fire within its cloud. There is this cross towering uh, in the sky of Mars that is made of the souls uh, um, that have their residence there. For um, the image uh, is significant as it is in the context of, uh, because it is in the context of uh, the heaven of Mars, in which the source draw the, the shape of a cross that towers in the sky. Um, the identification, as we already heard of cross and the tree of life is obviously well represented in Franciscan literature and iconography. A two influential Latin works come to mind. Uh, the first one is Bonaventura, Bonaventura's uh, Tree of Life, Lignum Vitae, that you can, uh, you can see there. But as you uh, surely know, Bonaventura, Bonaventura is an early follower of St. Francis, uh, is the author of Tree of Life and many other, and the scholar uh, of many other works. It's an, a towering figure in the Franciscan and not only um, um, theology um, of the 13th century. Um, and the, the, the book, the Lignum Vitae, um, is an aid for representing, for presenting meditation upon the suffering of Christ. I'm quoting from a website that, uh, that is uh, the British Library. Uh, di diagram like the one on the screen were meant to help preachers organize their thoughts and communicate them effectively, which is an interesting aspect when we when it comes to these are as the Yossi was saying diagrams for memo technique so uh, how to speak in public and how to preach uh, how to remember things how to connect things um to organize their thoughts and communicate them effectively on the other hand the memo, memo technique function functions of these trees uh, of life find their inspiration in those uh, created by the apocalyptic thinker uh, Joachim uh, of Fiore, whose works exerted a great deal of inspiration, uh, theological inspiration, uh, both on the Franciscan theology and on Dante. And here uh, there is uh, the astonishing uh, Liber Figurarum, that is a corpus Christi College in Oxford. Uh, these are just um, amazing to, to watch it. I, I didn't even try to delve into their content. Um, I'm just scrolling these uh, images that you find that um, it is a bit, they are wonderful. And so there is the apocalyptic uh, uh, thinker, but but there is also memo technique here at, at play. Um, and uh, of course, a, another uh, Another author that comes to mind when it comes to Franciscans from Dante's perspective is Ubertino da Casale, and in particular, uh, the Arbor Vitae Crucifix uh, Christi, uh, where you see that no, the, uh, there you have Ubertino uh, uh, venerating the, the, the cross that is a tree of life. And uh, that is the same tree of Bonaventura, if you want, because it also has a technique function and it helps also with meditation and uh, um, uh, uh. so trees and plants are conspicuously representing the symbolic geography of Dante's afterlife. Uh, from dark forest in which the narration begins uh, to the divine forest, the ancient silva, dense and the light, mighty forest, I'm quoting of uh, purgatory, the top of purgatory, the Eden, uh, the earthly paradise that Dante places at the summit of Mount Purgatory. Uh, um, so, uh, here, an intricate allegorical procession. So when, when we get uh, to the top of Mount Purgatory is where 
Dante, or uh, not Dante, the tree said that we would find the, the tree of life or perhaps the tree of knowledge or human uh, beings. We are there. Uh, are we going to find this tree? Uh, so what we see there, what Dante sees is an, an intricate, at some point, uh, an intricate procession, a processional parade uh, um, with uh, difficult to uh, understand allegorical meanings. And here you see uh, uh, the uh, same manuscript uh, all come uh, from the Bodleian Library. The, the tree of life or the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil, we don't know, is there on the left. At one point, Dante's vision focuses on the action of a griffon, uh, a traditionally believed to represent Christ, uh, who ties the chariot that is believed to be the church to the tree. Dante describes this as a, a tree stripped of leaves and all else in every branch. Its head, which spreads out more the more it goes up, would be admired by the Hindus in their woods for its height. Is this the tree of life? Dante says that when the chariot is tied to the tree, the latter comes back to life. So I, we might read this, we have time, maybe not at all, but let's read together the, the passage in very passage. So Adam, I heard that you have Dante speaking, uh, all of them murmuring, and, and, and then they grew around the tree with every branch had been stripped of flowers and leaves. As it grows higher, so its branches spread wider, it reached the high that even in the forest would amaze the Indians. Blessed are you whose leaf does not obliquely pluck the sweet tasting fruit that is forbidden and, and then afflicts the belly that has eaten. So, round the robust, robust tree, the others shouted. And the true natural animal, thus, is the seed of every routless man for preserve. And turning to the poor shaft, he had, uh, I'm not sure if he the word, <laughs> to find the I can, he drew it uh, to the foot of the sweet tree and with a branch of that tree tied the tree, the chariot and the tree. That's like our plants that when the great light falls on her, mixed with the light that shines behind the stars of the celestial fishes, well, with buds, each plant renews its coloring before the sun and you know, it's hints beneath another population. So the tree, this balls before had been so solitary, was now renewed, showing a, a tent that was less than the rose, more than the violet. Um, some readers, both, both ancient and modern, uh, note that this is not necessarily the tree of Eve and Eden, uh, despite the many allusions to that myth in the final, the final account of Purgatory. And we start with the calling a voice calling Adam. So this must be perhaps, but a scholarship on the comedy points out uh, this tree is to be linked to the tree King Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreams about. Uh, in the book of Daniel, chapter four, the tree could represent the monarchy, many says. Like the tree in the book of Denner dreams represent the sovereign himself. And I want to read that this passage. These are the vision I saw while lying in bed. I looked up there before me to the tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong and its top touched the sky. It was visible of, uh, to the end of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful. Its fruits have looked good. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the fruits abundant, and on, on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. As Daniel would explain, this is the king. 
uh, draining of it itself, then the, the tree will be uh, spoiled, that will be become naked and uh, become like an animal, uh, among animals. Um, so, um, and these are my few uh, consideration, final consideration, considerations that are not an answer to the title that I gave to the book. These are just a preparation for a possible future answer. These are among the most impervious canvas uh, of the poem because of the density uh, of their allegorical conception, which remain uh, largely, largely unresolved. Uh, it would be surprising to think that the tree of life or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil are not where we expect them to be in the, in the um, earthly paradise on top of Mount Purgatorio, at the center of the six final cantos of Purgatorio, devoted to the earthly paradise, which Dante situated at the top of the mountain. Perhaps Dante is experimenting here, and this is a, a thought, uh, with the creation of a new myth, like the myth of Purgatorio itself, Purgatory, which is the creation um, of Dante, in the forms we, we see it, uh, that combines images of the of the biblical tree uh, with that from Daniel 4. Um, I cannot venture here into testing any of these hypotheses. I would require more familiarity than I have with the biblical exegesis, uh, both Jewish and Christian, on, for instance, um, the possibility uh, of connecting Daniel 4 with Genesis. In Buka, is the Bukazena tree traditionally connected to Genesis 2, uh, 9? I'm showing here uh, an illumination of the same scene from another um, illuminated manuscript. And uh, which is the, another famous uh, copy of the Divine Comedy on uh, Yates Thompson, 36. And uh, as you can see, the artists, the illuminator, think that they need, they need to be there, which in this case of knowledge of evil, uh, of good and evil, and it places it there, but uh, it's not there in like, the text. So here you see a commentary to the to the text, visual commentary to the text that kind of add, uh, because there we expect to find those trees. But the tree that we find in Divine Comedy, at the top of the Divine Comedy, perhaps is not exactly neither this nor the other, or at least uh, I'm, it's not clear uh, what those trees are. Even though Dante broke his trees from lower in the purgatory, said that those lower trees were from the same root of the say of the trees of Genesis. And and here uh, I thank you. <laughs> there are questions, they are all welcome, but And um, if you have a, a suggestion and explanations, I would uh, very much um, appreciate that. Have any insight? Yes, please. Oh, yes, probably. <laughs> Molto grazie. That was uh, fascinating, really, and evocative. Um, and the images are astounding. I was taken by the um, images of the chariot with this griffin-like creature, which uh, I associate with Ezekiel, that's Yeheskel, chapter one, with these chariot, uh, the Merkavot, which is a whole branch of Jewish mysticism, Merkavah mysticism. Uh, and the creatures with the four faces, 
that were kind of half human, half animal. So I wonder whether that's also reflected there. These, why the chariot appears with these strange creatures in purgatory or wherever Dante was. Yeah, what? Do you see any connection with uh, Ezekiel chapter one? So the, the traditionally, uh, traditionally, the um, ancient and modern scholarship uh, tend to see in the in the Griffin Christ, um, and Christ uh, is uh, tying the chariot to the tree, uh, meaning that is uh, tying the church to the tree. That represents probably the monarchy or the empire or let's say the um, the institution of this world um, but on on this uh, up to the most recent uh, recent commentaries on on, on on all the scene which is the scene that uh, developed through uh, a, a couple of cantos um, with the incredibly um, stratified uh, sequence of figures and uh, scenes happening, uh, there is uh, no clear um, agreement on, on the meaning and the sources of it. Uh, so uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, as I said, I, I wouldn't try to add my interpretation <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to the menu that had been given. Um, sure, there, there is a, a website that is called the Dartmouth College uh, Dante, uh, where you can basically have uh, a, most of the ancient and some of the modern commentaries to the, to the Divine Comedy on each word. Uh, each line of the divine comedy. So the amount of uh, scholarship on each word is, is uh, outstanding. And, uh, uh, and I was going through it for this particular pass passage and I noticed uh, how even the more, the, the more kind of trusted and esteemed scholars from the 14th centuries up to uh, now, uh, they say, surely is not that, uh, it's this, but the one, the other one says that surely it's not this, is the other thing. Uh, and they kind of, the thing, uh, my, uh, my answer to uh, something that I was thinking this morning while coming here and listening to a podcast from a, a preacher on the Genesis 2, uh, um, and uh, the, there was, he was saying, you know, when, uh, when, uh, when we read something, a text, we try uh, to imagine, give an, an image to it. Well, Dante, what he does is, is not only give an image, but create something new. Because when he, give, he gives an image to this thing that nowadays we call purgatory, he creates the purgatory. So uh, when he probably imagined what happened to the tree of life, to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, at his time, he is creating something. So I'm not sure we can find a solution by trying to uh, look at uh, the sources uh, because there, there are uh, contradictions within uh, the this allegorical uh, possession uh, that cannot be solved. So uh, we are tempted to find like there, there must be a logic because like, as if Dante were to stick to an interpretation. Yeah. No. Uh, did you? This is a wonderful conversation, and I would love to speak with you for hours about all of this 
metaphorical symbolism, okay? I didn't have time in my own presentation to elaborate on um, distinctions, let's say, between Judaism and Islam on the one hand and Christianity on the other with this elaborate cosmological uh, symbolism that make makes sense if I, you know, if I put my Franciscan uh, beanie on, and and Saint Francis is my favorite saint, and I've been to Assisi twice, and I love it there. Um, the whole notion of the cross as a tree of life, which I had one image of, and you had a few images of, makes perfect sense symbolically if you see Christ as the second Adam atoning or helping humanity atone for this original sin of the first Adam, which prevented Adam, Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve from getting to the tree of life. So this is the, the spiritual tikkun, the rectification of that original violation where God becomes in flesh and becomes the Paschal lamb sacrifice that, which is very un-Jewish, right? Uh, makes sense uh, not just allegorically, but existentially uh, for Christian. And, and so I find this um, resonant uh, in terms of my, you know, my right brain symbolism, uh, totally divorced from theology, you know, where we argue, but the symbolism is, is, is something very deep and transformational, uh, whether you're a Christian or not. So thank you. I wanted to quickly throw in a related follow-up question on this idea that Dante is drawing on the real Jerusalem for purgatory, the idea of pilgrimage. Um, so if he's trying to think about the embodiment, right, the, the actual real kind of existence and life of, of the tree after Genesis, what would that mean in the context of the invention of purgatory, especially in contrast to his sources, say, from Arabic culture, which I know you're an expert on. That's a, turned into a much bigger question. I'm sorry. I'll let you answer it in the talk. And uh, as, I, as I said at the beginning, and I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to be um, kind of dismissive of questions, but I really find myself uh, working in a uh, garden of allegory, most of which um, I, I don't understand uh, partially for uh, limited scholarship of, from my side, but partially because I, um, I think uh, Dante sometimes uh, works uh, as a, uh, in a mythopoetic form, like he creates myth rather than uh, uh, interpreting only uh, so we try sometimes perhaps to understand as if he was a, uh, logically operating uh, in relation to sources, but perhaps he, he creates in a myth. And uh, <laughs> yes, and but also um, sometimes, yes, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, kind of picking up on this, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, dialectic between the symbolic and uh, allegorical versus the real and actual. Um, there's a great painting, just to throw in some more visual material because you were thinking about that in your presentation. It's a panel painting, it's in Florence in the Academia, by Pacino da Bonaguido, I think. And it's from the early 14th century and it's similar to Christ crucified on the tree of life. It, it is it is a, a visual a painting of Bonaventures, um, Abor Vitae. But Christ is crucified on this this allegorical diagrammatic tree where the medallions are the fruits 
that are real fruits, but they're basically they're based on these immaterial virtues that Bonaventure is talking about. But the tree itself on the bottom, unlike what you showed there, it has the pelican on top and the heavenly community on the top too. But at the bottom is the story from Genesis, is the Garden of Eden, and the, the tree of life is rooted there next to the um the tree of knowledge from which Adam and Eve are plucking. So it's in, in that case, you have both because it is a real place. Like what Catherine was talking about, people in Italy do paradise is there. It's on earth. Um, so I think that might be an interesting visual component. The other thing I was thinking of, the, the tree of Nebuchadnezzar. The only other time I've really seen that as a tree of life or compared to the tree of life is in 15th century prints from proto-reformers. There's one in a treatise by Johannes Geiler from Kaisersberg. This is a group of proto-reformers out, out working out of Strasbourg where they're quoting Daniel and Christ is crucified, not on the tree of life, as you see in so many pictures, especially printed ones in the 15th century, but it is the tree of Nebuchadnezzar. And it's because they're opposed to the idea of the legend, the fact that the real tree exists that Christ was, that, that's anathema to the reformers who want to make the, tr the, the cross and the wood of the cross abstract again. And the better abstracted tree for them, at least visually, to throw a crucified Christ on is the tree from Nebuchadnezzar because it's this kind of some more of a symbolic tree and it's divorced from all of the lore around <laughs> the Genesis one. I can send, I can show you some pictures of that, but it's just, just thinking of where I've seen that in art, that's really the only place specifically related to the tree of life. Yeah, but 